Open University. Ciao class, I want to think about design today. It's something I think about professionally because I've been a, a design journalist for people like Design Observer and, um, and uh, various, like Diseño, this magazine, or various other people. And um, design has been personally important to me. Uh, you can see that uh, I like to display beautifully designed objects like this record sleeve, which is um, contemporary music of Japan, second-hand record, which uh, I don't know who this sleeve is actually by. It looks like a... Um, it looks like either an original um, Frank Stella or a ripoff of a Frank Stella, or it could be any number of mid 20th century um, designers indebted to Joseph Albers, for instance. So I'm really particularly interested in that period of the mid 20th century, from say 1950 onwards, when um, a sort of minimalist, abstract. Um, aesthetic invaded corporate America and corporate Europe and um, there was a sense of uh, playfulness and of colour which uh, and, and you would get these uh, Miesian office towers where the, the companies would have their headquarters and in front there would be an abstract sculpture and then their, pr their printed material would have beautiful design they'd have a logo by Paul Rand they'd have um, uh, they'd employ very good designers to do their advertising and so on and so on and this gave the image at least of an enlightened capitalism it was a confident time for the west because they had won a war against an opponent there was another opponent of course the, the russians in the cold war who had a different aesthetic because stalin was in power at that time and you had um, stalinist kitsch and socialist realism as the, the prevailing aesthetics in that block and so the west almost by default had to to go into abstraction formalism, minimalism, and various kinds of what the Russians, what the Soviets called decadent formalism. So uh, you had this weird situation where people like the CIA were actually subsidizing abstract expressionist artists. Of course, there was no immediate political content in that. It was very stripped art. In fact, the, the less politics or even, even semantic freighting that was in that uh, the less meaning it had, the better, because it bec could become a pure symbol of the West's colorful enlightenment. And um, I think it's very dubious whether the CIA understood anything about art and artists, but the artists themselves were able to strike superior moral stances as a result of being used in this way, or the designers. And there's an interesting quote I found by Robert Motherwell, the abstract painter, he said, most people ignorantly suppose that artists or designers are the decorators of our human existence, the esthetes to who, whom the cultivated may turn when the real business of the day is done. Far from being merely decorative, the artist's awareness is one of the few guardians of the inherent sanity and equilibrium of the human spirit that we have. Oh, that's a tall order. It's sort of aspirational. <clears throat> and... Um, the designer I particularly want to think about today is a guy who, whose work I like a lot, um, Giovanni Pintori, who worked uh, from 1950 for Olivetti Corporation in Italy, and who is associated with a, a clear and colorful, rather a geometric abstraction in his posters and his corporate um, uh, material, graphic material for Olivetti. And he said in 1961, I've always believed in the strength of simple ideas and the demand for clear, immediate language that is accessible to everyone. This doesn't mean that the language of graphics is downgraded to the most common taste. Just the opposite. It means that the language intends to improve average tastes. This is a goal I set a long time ago. Now, he's walking a rather... <laughs> he's squaring some circles, to speak geometrically, in that statement. He's saying that, uh, OK... The, clear immediate language but not one which panders to the clear immediate language which the people subscribe to themselves. Um, it's one which has to be aspirational. In other words he's making a case for the professional involvement of art school trained designers rather than <clears throat> in the interests of immediate and clear communication which is of a higher order than the immediate and clear communication of when I, if I'm running my own little garage you know, I can paint a sign that says out of gas, 
and that's very clear and immediate. Okay, we don't have any gas, but uh, if you involve somebody to design mobile for you, design the the corporate look and the the visuals of the mobile uh, gas station, then you you obviously are not going to use that language. You're going to use a a language of modernism, and and in, in a sense, the ideals of modernism, especially capitalist corporate modernism in the 20th century, were communicated by a very small number of professional designers like Paul Rand. Um, and Paul Rand puts it down to a kind of enlightened <coughs> clique of CEOs uh, who actually understood the value of design and actually incorporated designers in the process of making their building their corporations. And he cites um, the Arco Oil Company, Robert Anderson, and he says that as soon as Robert Anderson departed, the, their design standards collapsed. And the same thing happened with CBS when William Paley and Frank Stanton were no longer active. Um, Westinghouse, uh, Container Corporation of America, um, Rawley Warner at um, uh, Mobile, who, who employed Elliot Noyes to do their, their design. So there was a certain moment when... Um, for some reason, and maybe because, because of the whole historical upset of... Um, OK, let's go back to the Bauhaus. Uh, the Bauhaus, the art school in Germany, which um, employed a lot of uh, designers and, and, and very forward-thinking modernists, people who had embraced modernism very quickly in the 1920s, who were then disrupted and displaced when the Nazis closed the Bauhaus in, I think, 1933. Those people mostly went to America. So they had a, a European aesthetic and an aesthetic of, you know, uncompromising modernism. And, and the idea of, of being advanced, and, and, and this was then thrown into Britain and America uh, almost against those countries' will uh, when those people became emigres and refugees, basically, exiles from, from their country. And um, so in a sense... The things that, mo that America in the 20th century is known for, the sort of image you have of the U.S. in the 20th century is of skyscrapers, hamburgers, you know, um, jeans, uh, whatever. But uh, actually, the, part, the modernist parts of those uh, come from, mostly from Germany, skyscrapers and hamburgers. You know, these are both German inventions. Um, the jeans are a French invention because they come from, uh, they're denim, they come from De Nîmes, the city of Nîmes. So that's, it's a Franco-German kind of import, all that. I think cowboys, they, they can genuinely claim to have invented, although it's possible that, that, that you know, the high steps of Russia invented the cowboy. Um, <clears throat> but uh, America's moral, assumed moral superiority in the post-war period rests to some extent on its design programs and uh, on the sense of legitimation that they give it. Because if you're a graphic designer, a corporate designer, a product designer... Legitimation is part of what you're, you're bringing to the brief. Uh, you're not just coming in to look, make something look pretty. You're, you're, you're making it look um, morally superior, ethically and aesthetically superior. So I think these people making big claims for design, like Paul Rand. Paul Rand, after all, just, you know, you could say, wow, he just made some, some geometric logos for a lot of different companies that made them look impersonal and... Uh, Weirdly, slightly sinisterly elegant sometimes. But um, if you're a designer, you're a bit like an architect as well. Um, you know, you have to make a, a case for being brought in as an outsider, perhaps not even knowing how the companies work or how they make their products. I mean, there are in-house designers and in-house building managers who could do the architect's job or the designer's job and perhaps could do it with with the kind of knowledge in the box, as it were, which is both more conformist and more, more intimately connected with the production process because they work in, in the corporation. So, but you have to make a case for bringing a fresh vision and bringing some kind of otherness, some kind of, you know, the art school mentality or, or superior professionalism or whatever it is, or, or simply your successful association with... This is that any consultant has to push this, that, yeah, I, I turned that company around because I gave them a fresh look and I, I could see a, a something which they couldn't see from inside their particular situation, that people wanted things to look simpler or cleaner or clearer 
Obviously, the, the contemporary example of this kind of designer is, um, is Ives, Jonathan Ives at uh, Apple. <clears throat> We've seen a bit less of him recently. The, the, I was just watching somebody on Twitter complaining that skeuomorphic design has come back in. Apparently, he was going to banish. He did the hardware, and then there were fewer and fewer changes in each new iteration of the iPhone, for instance. So it seemed like almost he was being sidelined a little bit. But then he was given a brief of software design, and he was taking away all the fake leather, and the kind of incompatible, imitative, skeuomorphic um, uh, uh, design from the operating systems. But now that, that's crept back a little bit in the form of, say, the, the new uh, emoticons that uh, Apple has put on its touch bars. Suddenly there are all these funny little masks and things you can push or smiley faces or whatever, which are, in a sense, skeuomorphism coming in by the back door because they've made a slightly more realistic... You know, you, there's a Tengu icon that you can push now and it's got a slightly more realistic nose and different kind of eyebrows and stuff so it's almost like that's all started to come back in so this sense of a this for that moment when the iPhone's um, iOS uh, 9 or whatever it was or 8 suddenly got flat and there was no more three dimensionality was quite a radical moment because it almost looked like in some ways a step backwards but it was a step towards clarity and this clarity brought with it the idea of a superior Rationality. So I want to think about whether um, design... Is it making something inherently evil look good? Or is there also the possibility that by giving those corporations the idea that they're morally and aesthetically superior, it actually makes them so? There may be some kind of effect by which if your company has a, a really clean and clear and beautiful image, it might be... <laughs> might be encouraged to act and behave beautifully to consider itself as part of a sort of enlightening effort uh, doing good in the world um, I think we can see problems with that idea it's a pretty optimistic idea because you, if you look at Volkswagen for instance who, whose advertising and whose public image has been um, very much about being virtuous partly because again goes back to the war the, the fact that Hitler is associated with the foundation of Volkswagen they had to come along in the 60s and look like a hippie company or a, a kind of virtuous folksy um, almost a, a kind of a peasant image of canny socialistic cars that uh, and so on and so you know they had but they had very clear clean and humorous advertising but uh, uh, with the recent emissions scandal, um, when they're seen to be deliberately um, jigging, uh, tricking the uh, emissions inspectors, that image goes out the window. So obviously the design in itself, or that kind of image that they carried with them, has not kept them away from uh, doing bad things. But um, I'm interested in... I mean, for, for me personally, design is very important. I've been talking to a, a publisher recently about um, doing a, a book for them. And the first thing I kind of want to know about is, uh, is the cover. Oh, the first thing I do... Actually, the first thing I sit down and do, rather than writing the book, is I kind of make a mock cover for myself, just to have on my desktop, on my computer, uh, which tells me what it's going to be like as a book, what, wh how, how the book will fit in the bookshop, how it'll look on the shelf, how it'll be as a visual object, because it's actually, a, this time, it's a physical object, the book, it's going to be a paper object. So um, the kind of thing I tend to do <laughs> is I tend to make something which is a bit like a pastiche, um, and you, you may well have seen this cover which I did for Un America. Uh, which is um, obviously a pastiche of Fontana, Modern Masters, the series. Actually, the, uh, the 70s. I think it was started in the 60s, but this kind of design appeared in the 70s. And um, why do I do pastiches? I do them partly because they're playful and tongue-in-cheek, but also because they really buy into the, the values of the thing there. They steal the soul, in a sense, of the, the thing they're pastiching, take a little bit of that magic and, and, and the pixie dust and try to sprinkle it across the project. So this, obviously it's nostalgic for me. Uh, I was buying these books in the 70s. I still like to see them in second-hand shops. And they speak of a 70s, uh, a groovy, minimalist rationality, um, 
a moment when dry didacticism could meet up with uh, some kind of cool, uh, some kind of arty love of colour, first of all, for its own sake, a love of uh, a conceptual sequence of colours, because each of these, there's a very elaborate scheme, you can look it up, uh, in which these covers uh, sort of worked together. And, um, but also... Um, the, the, actually, the new book, which I've been doing, the cover I came up, which I can't show you yet, uh, uh, but the cover I came up with, um, it really tries to refer to the moment when a very, an imaginary moment, it, it, it sort of makes this parallel world, just by, just, just, you just have to look at it, and you're in this world, it, you're in Paris in 1969, and there's a, a conservative company that hasn't changed its book design for decades, very classical, its covers look like sheet music covers. And then a young designer, a funky young designer, comes into the company and he, um, he just changes the typography and the, um, the mon um, colophon, the sort of logos of the, the, the monograph. Is it monograph? Not monograph. Um, monograms that are used on the, the front, the sort of typographic devices that are used on the front of the books, and he, he puts a slightly funkier one, slightly Paul Randian image there. There's, n there's no actual pictures on there's just typographic and, and graphic. So, um, and and, and he, he changes the colour to a more vibrant orangey red colour on the title. He changes the typography on the title and he changes the logo. They both have this vibrant orange red, which could only really come from the turn of between the 60s and the 70s. Um, and uh, to me, it's very clear that, that but you know, I've, I lived through 1970, and, and so for me, it might just be a nostalgic reference which other people don't pick up. Younger people might not pick that up. My whole concern about colors and uh, design is all tied up with personal nostalgia for the time when I first began to become aware of design, which is when I was in, you know, coming up to the age of 10, essentially and aware of the difference between different European countries and their conceptions of design, I realized very early that Italy was a funky place because I used to fly. We lived in Greece in, uh, from 69 onwards, so a couple of years. And, uh, but I was sent to boarding school in Scotland, but the British Council would fly me out every school holidays to Greece to be with my family. Uh, my dad was working for the British Council. And um, we, often that flight would stop over in Rome Airport. So I'd get out and... You'd, you could walk around the airport between flights, and um, I was just staggered by how cool even old men in Italy were with their herringbone suits and things, the beautiful colors of suits and color, form, texture, shape, uh, design, architecture. All these things in Italy were unlike anything I was seeing in Britain. Um, and it was also, that was also a time when foreignness still meant something, uh, still meant more, certainly, than it does now. So it, there really was a change, an immediate change in atmosphere when you went from Britain, say, to France. You could see the design standards were totally different between the two countries. I mean, France had its own weird... There was a Galapagos effect in terms of French cars, for instance, looked like they were suspended on uh, rubber bands and uh, sort of descended from agricultural machinery. But then, you know, you'd get something like the Citroën de chevaux, um, painted bright orange or something. So you get this weird, it is a weird moment when very conservative and um, practical designs suddenly got bright colours. So I, I went and did this when, when I lived in Athens. I had a, an old second-hand bicycle which had uh, mudguards and dynamo and, you know, very, very unfunky bicycle. So I took off the mudguards and I painted the frame mustard yellow because that was the colour that year. And uh, suddenly I had this collision of uh, the conservative and the funky. And I've always really liked that, because that, the conservative preserves certain things which are formally appealing, um, like the simplicity of these, uh, these um, Gallimard NLF books. I, I, I love the way that they preserve, to this very day, they've preserved this format. And actually you can still buy this book, which I, I think this edition of it comes from the 50s, but you can still buy it today in a brand new edition with the same cover. Uh, they've, it just and now it says "corrigé," corrected version. It doesn't say "précédé de." But um, that's something I particularly like. Or uh, people who preserve things for a long time, but also people who 
the sensibility changes in the interim. So you could say that about, say, Doc Martin's shoes, that you have a company that had been making the same designs of shoes for decades. Uh, they had their patented airwear soles, which gave them a, a different look from all the other shoes because there was this weird semi-translucent uh, rubber, thick rubber sole, which gave them an awful, almost brothel creeper look, but then a very conservative top. So fashions had come and gone, and that, that top conservative top had not changed at all. And then um, because they hadn't changed, the same thing happened with Hush Puppies, because they hadn't changed the design, it came back into fashion at a certain moment. It was a look that became classic, so-called classic, which actually doesn't mean timeless. A, cl a classic is simply something which uh, um, is rooted in a particular time and, and, and didn't really change. I mean, you could call that... Uh, NRF cover, a, a classic cover, but uh, and it does refer to classical music in some ways, but uh, I wouldn't call it classic. I, I would say it's very clearly rooted in the design of the the late 19th century, even, that one. Uh, it is basically a 19th century design, which they simply didn't change because they couldn't be bothered to, or, or they felt that there's a kind of accumulating um, semantic uh, glow around something that uh, you don't want to destroy so and that allows you just as a stopped clock is right twice a day it allows you to be fashionable from time to time as your so-called classic uh, qualities come in and out of fashion again so I think yeah I think if you stick to your gun this is kind of also what I hope for moments that the, my style of writing songs goes out of fashion and then comes back into fashion and if I if I stick with it it somehow will seem dated a lot of the time but you know Every couple of decades, the stopped clock will be right again. Um, poor design, says uh, Paul Rand. Um, a good design can't be dictated or willed. It's not the product of market research, but of natural talent, relevant ideas, mutual respect, without which design programs eventually will unravel and good design wither away. Um, I still see, I still see um, design which appeals to me, and I, I think design is particularly important. If you look at tr Trump, the arrival of Trump, and Trump is obviously someone whose design standards are very, very low and some, somehow on the level of, say, Saddam Hussein, this idea of a glitzy palace with lots of gold uh, chandeliers and terrible um, you know, elevated doors which are made of solid gold and all the rest of it. I think this is um, clearly appalling design, and the U.S. will... Uh, insofar as he has any influence, will look terrible for the next four years at least. Um, perhaps forever, who knows? Perhaps he, he, uh, he's going to follow Putin's example. He loves Putin and uh, he's just going to try and stay there forever. But uh, I think it's, um, it's a time when we shouldn't lose sight of design's um, capacity to morally elevate and to, to provide some aspirational influence on the societies it's working with. Obviously, it, is, it colludes with... Uh, some of the worst corporate entities in the world. But um, I think it can influence them to the good, to some extent. And I think even just the illusion that something is morally and aesthetically and spiritually ele elevating makes us feel better, makes some of us anyway feel better. Perhaps the whole idea of design is, is ending. And you know, perhaps it's um, the pessimistic view will be the one taken by the late Mark, Mark Fisher, who believed that music uh, had not evolved after about 2005, that we were simply on a, a retro cycle of endlessly retreading old ideas and that there was no sense of fashion anymore in music. There were no new musical sounds and movements coming up. There was no sense of a generation being gripped by something in the way that our generation was gripped by punk. And that, in a sense, the idea of the contemporary itself has died. That is possible. It's quite possible. If you look at the attacks on contemporary art, they're by the same people who are attacking um, the European Union and all the, the, um, the sort of um, transnational organizations. These are coming under daily attack. I was reading stuff today about how people want to short the euro. The guy who's going to be Trump's uh, European man is, um, is saying that he thinks the euro currency is not going to last uh, 18 months, and he would he would advise people to short the euro from from now, which is which is at least going to infuriate the EU and make it get its uh, shit together. Let's hope as a kind of um, counterbalance to this appalling 
nationalism and uh, the appalling taste of the Trump regime. Let's say, let's just, let's just even just say, forget the fact that he's defunding the EPA and all the rest of the awful things he's doing. Let's just look at him as, as a truly disgusting tastemaker um, and say that design can fight back against that in its own small way, but also to remember the, um, the moment when design seemed to uh, incarnate something better. Open University. 